God's love. Elevating, energizing, empowering. Miracles happen when you know that you are loved. Peter Youngren has communicated God's love with millions from every religion and culture. Get ready for your ultimate life because you are loved. Welcome to our telecast today. We are continuing this very important and very intriguing study, who really is God? You know, there's a lot of opinions about who God is. A lot of people feel God is very angry and vengeful and they are scared of God. And, and yesterday or in the previous program, we looked at some of the, I showed you some pictures that maybe respond to this. Who, who really is God and where do, we, where do we learn about God from? I said, we learn from our parents. You see the picture right there? We, we, Learn from authority figures, you know, we, we, uh, society, religion, the authorities of religion tell us this is who God is and who really is God. Uh, I talked about that some people have a genie in the bottle, God, you know, if you just, um, just rub Aladdin's lamp the right way and, and, you know, then the spirit will come out and bring great prosperity. Others think of God as a far away, like, like a stairway to heaven, and, and, and God is up there, and we need to call him down. Others think of God as a micromanaging judge who looks at your life through a magnifying glass and, 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 and kind of judges you whether you measure up or not. And I said, in the mythology of Santa Claus, you see him there with his list, we, we have some pictures of God. People say, you know, they look at God just the same way that, that you know, just like Santa Claus, according to the song, he's, he has a list and he's checking it. And if you've been naughty or nice, if you've been good or you've been bad, and if you've been good, you know, you're going to get certain benefits. And if you've been bad, you're going to get nothing. And he knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. So he's checking you all the time. People think God is like that. Is that really who God is? Is, is, is God like that? Someone that you send your prayer request as kids do, sending their request to Santa Claus in the North Pole, and you send them up into heaven somehow hoping for an answer? Is that the way God is? And we said, you know, based on the Bible, this is so amazing. Many people say, well, you know, Jesus is God, and that's wonderful. But that is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God is just like Jesus. Hebrews 1, 3 says, the Son Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. So exactly, the expressed image, the very, the very essence of who God is, is depicted in Jesus. Colossians 1:19, it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Everything that we would include in the word fullness, everything that God is, everything God has is expressed through Jesus. Colossians 2, 9, in him dwells all the fullness of the God at bodily. So it is Jesus' bodily expression. When you see Jesus in action in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see Jesus doing things. You see Jesus touching and healing and looking at people. That's the way God is. That's the exact image of God. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So we look at Jesus and we say, that's the way God is. And what difference does it make? Does it make any difference whether we think God is petty, small-minded, vengeful, or whether we think God is compassionate and loving? Does it make any difference at all? Well, it does profoundly affect our life because whatever we think of God, we think of ourselves. And whatever we think of God and ourselves, we think of others. And in fact, when we see who God really is, the Bible calls that our eyes being opened. Wow, everything changes. I want to bring to you just two absolutes that we see in Jesus, two absolute facts. And if, if, if we see that in Jesus, that is exactly the way God is. I'd say, first of all, God is a great redeemer. To redeem means to buy out of, to buy free. One illustration would be like when you get in the mail, you know, they send you some coupons and those coupons are there, but you go and redeem the coupon. You cash it in. And so in a sense, God has redeemed us. He, he, sometimes we talk about redeeming a situation. Have you heard that expression? 
In other words, you know, somebody really made a fool out of themselves. Maybe they got drunk and they were cursing and they were, you know, doing all kinds of things. And so then they had to come up with something really good to do to make it good again, to make it, you know, make it, it's, it's okay again. And so they redeemed the situation. Well, really what happened with, with, with us and God is that we, we had all walked away from the God who loves us, but God redeems us. He makes it good for us again. See, Israel, they were slaves, and God redeemed them. He bought them free out of uh, their slavery. Uh, sometimes when we, when we talk about being redeemed and being set free, we start thinking about justice. You know, we, we think that, that, you know, God was about to punish the people, so Jesus bought us free from God's justice. Well, Jesus is God, and God is just like Jesus, so that doesn't make any sense at all. See, when we think of justice, when we think of redemption. We often think in terms of human definitions of these words. That's all we got, are human definitions. So we think in terms of that God's justice has to do with, with God having to punish someone. Because in our way of thinking of justice, the only thing we know about is punishment. Our justice system is about punishment. It's about punishing the speeding driver. It's about punishing the thief, uh, punishing the pickpocket, punishing the murderer. You know, we have a range of crimes, and the, and the one crime gets worse punishment than the other. And then if somebody is freed from that punishment, they're free, well, then they are redeemed out of the situation. But we have to say, understand, this is a human view of, of justice, the human Department of Justice, the Ministry of Justice with the government is all about punishment. But the word justice in the Bible is very much connected to the word redeem. It means to make things right. It means to turn the situation around. Whatever has gone wrong, you make it right. So that's why I said the illustration of someone messing up and just kind of making a fool of themselves and then doing something really good to redeem the situation. Well, that's a little bit of a picture of what God does for us. We have messed up, and God isn't looking to punish us. To God, justice is not to punish us. No, to, to, to God, justice is to make everything just all right, make it like it should have been. And see, the Bible has, in the first part of the Bible, which we call the Old Testament, there are pictures of this. There are actually laws of redemption. In Leviticus chapter 25, every 50th year was the year of Jubilee. So whatever had gone wrong, whatever you had messed up, if you lost the family farm, if you lost your, your freedom, you became like a bond slave. Well, every 50th year, everything was all right. Everything was made right again. You had a new start. Everything became just like it should have been. That, that's justice from God's point of view. God's justice is not to punish, but God's justice is to make everything all right. And then Jesus says that he is our year of jubilee. Jesus says, it's not every 50th year I have fulfilled the symbol of the year of Jubilee. And he says, right now, this is the acceptable year. This is the year of God's grace. This is the year of God's favor. We've been living in that for the last 2,000 years. So you see how, how eager God is to make things right for people? Jesus was very eager to make things right for people. Whether he met the outcast, the notorious sinners, or a leper, or a demon-possessed person, or whoever he met, he wanted to make things right for them. Well, as much as they had these laws of redemption, there's something even better. There was a provision in the Old Testament, which is symbolic for us, that if you were in a mess, if you were in a state of poverty, you had lost everything, a near relative could redeem you, could buy you free, to buy you out of your mess at any time. This wouldn't be, you have, don't have to wait every 50th year uh, for this, the year of Jubilee, but this would be immediate. You would be bought free. We know the story about uh, Ruth and Boaz. And Boaz was a near relative to Ruth who bought her free. He, he bought her out of that situation of poverty and abject misery that she was in. He bought her out immediately. And of course, there was another 
uh, even near a relative to Ruth, but he wasn't willing. He wasn't able or willing to do it. And you see, when it comes to you and I, uh, the law is that nearer relative. That legalistic religious mindset is that nearer relative, but the law and religious rules and laws have never been able to make things right for you. Did you notice that all the religious rules and laws that you have been exposed to, if you just do this and if you follow this, if you take these seven steps, then you're going to experience God's blessing. You know, that, that, that could never make it right to you, for you. Just like for Ruth in the Old Testament, that very closest relative, he wasn't willing or able. All those religious rules that you may have followed, they're not able to bring you the blessing. So then Boaz came in the story of Ruth. And he redeemed Ruth. And Jesus is our Boaz. Or Boaz, you could say, is depicted in Jesus. Jesus Christ became our redemption. He bought us free. He made things right for us. Just like it says in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, that God is Israel's redeemer. Then through Jesus Christ, the whole world is included. And what price was paid, Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. That's why we talk about Jesus' blood. That's why we talk about Jesus' death, uh, death on the cross. We talk about that because that is the payment to redeem us, to make us free. Now, whenever you make a payment, you think about who is getting paid? Who was paid off? Was Jesus paying off his heavenly father? Of course not, because Jesus and the Father are one, so he would be paying off himself. We're talking about that God is just like Jesus. Was he paying Satan? No, God didn't owe Satan anything. You could say that Jesus made the payment of his blood and death for one purpose, because in order to enter the kingdom of death or Hades, as the Greek called it, Hell is translated in our Bible sometimes. To be able to enter death, you have to die. You, you have to die. And Jesus shed his blood to the... You, you can't go into the kingdom of death without being dead. And so Jesus, on behalf of all of us, suffered death. He, he paid with his life, if you wish, to be able to enter the kingdom of death. He gained entrance, entrance into hell, into death, and of course, he went in there and he plundered it. The old church fathers called this a victory raid. He, he went in there and, 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 and he saw to it that the devil was forever defeated. I say it like this, when Jesus Christ went into the tomb, he carried your name. That's right, Susan. That's right, Harry. That's right, Muhammad. That's right, Raja. That's right, Margaret. That's right, Lucy. I don't know what your name is. You put your name there. When Jesus went into the grave, he carried your name with him. But when he rose from the grave, he gives you his name. He says, now I took your name with me into the grave that you might have full access to my name so that in the name of Jesus, you will go to the Father. And everything you ask in the name of Jesus, everything that is encompassed in the name of Jesus. It is yours. I'm telling you that victory that God provided when he redeemed us forever from hell and all that the devil had planned. It's awesome. Revelation 1, 17 says, Fear not, I'm the first and the last, the one who lives. I was dead, but behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and hell. Well, you can sit back and just say, Thank you, Jesus. That's the way God is. God didn't want anything bad for you. He doesn't want to punish you. He's not out to get you. God is for you. He wants to make things right for you. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't reconcile, God didn't reconcile himself to us because God was never our enemy. God didn't need to reconcile himself to us. He didn't need Jesus' blood to reconcile himself to us. God never was your enemy, but he reconciled us with God. We were kind of not, I don't, know, I, want, I don't know if I want God. I don't know if I want that. But what Jesus did, he made everything right by showing, look at this. I've identified with every shame, every guilt that you have ever known. And, and I've defeated all that. And I'm for you. So come to me. Oh, I hope that you're doing that. Call the number on the screen right now if you want to receive our booklet. 
uh, salvation, God's gift to you. We'll be glad to give it to you. Call right now. I tell you, whatever your name is, Jesus carried your name into the grave. He took you, all your failures, all your mistakes, all the shame, all the guilt, all the junk that is associated with your life. He carried that into death. And he comes out and he says, now you're mine. You have my name. Everything that's in my name is available to you. Uh, make sure you order this book. If you say, I want to know God better. I want to know God better. We're going to continue to talk a lot more. But first of all, I want you to see this. It is the question of the ages. Who really is God? Whatever we think of God, we ultimately end up thinking about ourselves. The ancient philosopher cried, God, deliver me from my God. This teaching answers questions like, have I developed God in my own image? Or is God just what I heard about from parents or authority figures? What is God really like? Get ready for an amazing discovery of the God who is just like Jesus. Well, you know, this could be the best $39 you ever spent, shipping and handling included. That's a pretty good deal. Five hours of teaching before a live audience, and you, you'll feel the energy of that, and, and it'll be a great resource to you. In my estimation, this is the most important teaching I have taught, I don't know, maybe ever, for, for years. I, I tell you, th this can create a revolution inside of you, and it certainly can spread, and we need a gospel revolution in our country. And so go ahead and order that. You have the information on the screen, and then... Before I go back to the teaching, I also want to say that we need your help. You know, we are working on so many frontiers in the Buddhist world, planning campaigns there right now coming up. We're investing in that area, heavily invested in bringing the gospel to the Islamic world, showing them who Jesus Christ is. By the tens of thousands, they are responding to receive more information about Jesus Christ. We're working right here in our own country and I want to say thank you for you being involved. And I, before I go back to the teaching, here's a little message of what it means to be a VIP, a, a visionary in partnership and a very important person in this ministry. Have your pen and paper out and then I would love for you to respond. The information is coming up and what this is all about. So watch this. VIP stands for very important person. But in World Impact Ministries, it also means visionaries in partnership. Believers who have committed to advance the gospel every month. This is urgent. God gave the opportunity for the only 24-7 Christian television channel in the world's largest Muslim city, and we said yes. Great gospel campaigns reach millions. Leadership seminars train thousands of pastors. Gospel television reaches around the world. And now, a 24-7 television channel that brings Christ to the Islamic world. At a time when many curse the barbaric evil and the darkness of Islamic terrorism, we shine the light of Jesus Christ where the darkness is the greatest. This is the Book of Acts Continued. The VIP family is about relationship with Christ and one another. The VIP family is about vision for everyone to hear the gospel because every person has immense value. The VIP family is about making history by giving the gospel to those who never heard. The VIP family is about a life and death mission as we join hands with believers who live in some of the most dangerous places on earth. You're needed. Become a visionary in partnership. Gospel campaigns are planned and financed many months ahead. Cable and satellite providers are paid monthly. Programs are produced weekly and new believers are followed up daily. Call now 1-877-974-7223 to join the VIP family. Give monthly through your bank account or your credit card. Whatever the amount or however you give, this is urgent. So please do it now. Call 1-877-974-7223 or give online at peteryoungren.org. Who really is God? When we look at Jesus described in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see who God is because God is exactly like Jesus. In the few minutes I have left with you today, and this could be tremendously life-changing, I want to talk about that God is the great physician. See, 
Jesus is referred to as the great physician, but if Jesus is the great physician, then God is the great physician. Mark 2.17 says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So here in this pictorial imagery, the problem is not being lost or being morally a criminal that is away from God, but here the human dilemma is described as a disease, not a legal or moral problem. The patient in question, the diseased patient is humanity. You and I, we could say individually, but the human race is the, is, is the, is the patient. And it says that Jesus has come for that patient. Now, now, see, again, this goes against what many have in their mind when they think of God. They're thinking God in, ter- in judicial terms. They're thinking God in terms of being a judge, a micromanaging judge who assesses whether you're good or bad. But, but that's not the imagery that Jesus has given us. He's saying God is like a physician, but he's a great physician. And you know, there's a big difference between going to the doctor or going to court. I mean, even if you are freed in court, you still have to go there and answer for what you've done. So going to court is all about being held accountable by a judge. Going to the doctor is something completely different, is going to be cured, to be helped. You're not judge if if you have cancer, if you have a disease, the doctor doesn't say, you stupid thing, you deserve this cancer, you deserve this back injury. No, 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 no. There's healing and compassion. You see, so there's two different things. Again, we are onto this image that many people think of God as a punishing God, of, of, of God who requires that you do penance. But, but the picture, the imagery that Jesus gives us is that this guilt and this sin of walking away from the God who loves us, walking away from a love source, it, it's a sickness and there are symptoms to that sickness. And, 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 and you come to Jesus He's the great physician. In in other words, you could say Jesus' presence is medicinal. He is the great physician. You come to him and you receive from him. Oh, I want you right now to just open up your heart to receive from God. See, think about that. There's no condemnation. There's healing from Jesus. You never have once Jesus telling a so-called known sinner that, that you're not worthy. You don't measure up. No, no. Jesus was not like that at all. This imagery of God as a great physician is seen already in the Old Testament. And Jesus referred to this, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And this story of the serpent being lifted up, you know, that's the story that's depicted on on our medic alert bracelets. You see this imagery of a snake wrapped around a pole, and for centuries that has symbolized healing. Well, You know, if if you're a gospel believer, first of all, you know that the serpent is a picture of the devil. If you wish, the the serpent personifies sin and shame. But then Jesus identified totally with our diseases. And, and, And so Jesus took upon himself all that shame that's associated with the serpent. And, 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 you know, sin in a sense, walking away from the God who loves us, going in our own direction. It is like the serpent's venom that infects everything. And what happens when Jesus becomes the great physician? Because, because, you know, physicians are great, but when Jesus becomes the great physician, he takes upon himself this venom. He, He takes the disease in himself. He lets the disease run its full course in him. So, so he, 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 no no doctor in the world will do that. No physician in the world will do that. Uh, The the physician, he or she, whatever it be, tries to treat your sickness and give you medication or perform a surgery. Jesus takes upon himself the disease of the patient, which is mankind. And that disease, it exhausts itself in Jesus. He becomes obedient even unto death, to the death of 
of the cross. Oh, that's where the victory happens. And then he rises again to conquer forever all the sin and shame. I mean, Colossians talks about this. It says, you being dead in your trespasses. He has made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle over them, triumph, triumphing over them in it. Wow. What a passage. Let me just, let me me talk this to you. It's going to take me just two minutes to get through this quickly. Stay with me now. Who did Jesus defeat? He defeated all religious powers and religious authorities that held you in bondage. How did he do it? By disarming them. He did what, when you disarm, you remove weapons. So what weapons did Jesus take from all these religious authorities and principalities? He took the legal charges and debts that were held against us. All the things that religion said, do this, do this, do this, and you hadn't lived up to it, and so you have a charge against you. Jesus took that. How did he disarm these charges of sin and guilt and and, and shame? By canceling them. How did he cancel these charges against us? Uh, All these inadequacies, how did he cancel them? By forgiving all of our sins. He says, your sins are put away. And what is the end result based on what we read here? God made us alive with Jesus Christ. I tell you, this is how much God loves you. All these pictures and symbols and prophecies that we study, They have no meaning whatsoever except through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and what he did for you gives meaning to the whole Old Testament. It makes it come alive. It makes you see this is what God has done for me. So he is the great, great physician. That's why we pray for sick people. That's why we say Jesus heals. Because a physical healing in your body is just a confirmation of how the sickness of sin and shame has been absorbed by Jesus. Oh, I'm doing this teaching just to open our eyes. And we say, oh my God is so beautiful. God is just like Jesus. God is not angry. He's not a condemning, petty, small-minded judge. But God is full of love. He has taken my disease. And now I receive the cure, which is his love. I want to hear from you. Call our Grace Prayer Center. Ask for the material that we are offering to you. And and we have free material to give you. Call for prayer. Remember, you are loved. Thank you. Your partnership makes this ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the good news of Jesus Christ to thousands who have never heard, Call 1-877-974-7223. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at PO Box 2108, Vista, California, 92085-2108 or 190 Railside Road, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M3A1A3. Together, let's give everyone a chance to hear the gospel.